Um, so I'll probably turn on both, right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for coming today, guys. Um, I can't believe you're not skiing right now, but uh, it's awesome you're here. Um, like, um, like he said, I was here 14 years ago, um, and it goes by so fast. Um, when I first started at BYU, I didn't know what I wanted to study. I was like uh, looking at all the courses. I thought I wanted to do business because I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but uh, I, I took a, I think I took financial management and got through the first two pages and almost threw up. It was, it was so boring. Um, but, uh, um, so I decided to major in English. I love to read. I love books. And I thought how cool it would be to just sit around and, uh, read, read a good book and talk about it, um, and to major in that. And so I ended up majoring in English and because it's a short major, I just took all the the cool courses that, uh, that looked fun to me. Anyone in here an English major? One, yes. You are my man. <laughs> so if you are an English major and you're interested in entrepreneurship, you will succeed. So good job. Um, I, are most people in here business majors or are you kind of spread out? If you're a business major, will you just raise your hand, just curious? Back when I started, they didn't have an emphasis in entrepreneurship. I th otherwise, I think I would have done it. Um, so um, I wanted to keep my education going in business, and so I applied for my MBA at BYU. Um, I got two months into the course, and I remember just sitting there in class and just thinking to myself, I can't do this. I can't do this. Like, my mind was going crazy. If you have ADD, raise your hand. I, I, would, I think a lot more of you guys have ADD than that, but um, I, ha I, I have ADD for sure, and I, uh, I, I just couldn't make it. And so there's uh, my, my first failure, right, um, or one of my failures. Um, there's a story about uh, two guys, Bill and Dave, who left their undergraduate early out of boredom and laziness. One day with nothing to do, they went hunting in the woods. They started drinking as they tromped through the forest looking for deer to shoot. As the alcohol slowly made them dumber and dumber, they got lost. As they were stumbling along, one of the hunters, Bill, suddenly saw a flash to his right, pulled out his rifle, and shot what he thought was a deer in the leg. <laughs> Immediately, he heard a blood-curdling scream and to his horror realized it was his friend Dave. As Dave was writhing on the ground, Bill pulled out his cell phone in a panic and called 911. 911, what's your emergency? I just accidentally shot my friend Dave and I think he's dead. What should I do, sir, calm down? First, please check his pulse and make sure he's dead so we know how to handle the situation. Bill, breathless, okay, okay, just a minute. Shh, shh, boom. Okay, now what? Um, don't be Dave and Bill, finish your education. How do you like that joke? It was kind of a dumb joke I thought of. <laughs> Sorry. He shot his friend, think, you know, making sure he was dead, that kind of thing. Don't drink alcohol while hunting or ever, if you can, if you can help it. I don't claim to be the most successful person that's ever come out of um, BYU, nor the smartest, but I do include myself in the ranks of those who truly bear testimony of their experience here at BYU. If you're not currently just absolutely loving your time here at BYU, I hate to say it, but that it's your fault. And what you can do to change that there are a lot of things. You can find a different group of people. You can start talking to different people. You can, go to, uh, you can go to different groups that are held on campus. You can start to change your experience because there is no greater place I, I, I find for joy and happiness um, during your college experience than here at BYU. I just love it here. Um, while away, I was out of town those last two weeks musing over the three most important lessons I have learned from being an entrepreneur over the last 14 years. And I wanted to talk about those three things. Um, the first is the art of the pivot. Uh, one of my most recent companies, drones, et cetera, dot com, we sell, it sells aerial photography drones. Um, it quickly became the highest, after, we started in 2013. Shortly thereafter, it became the highest traffic drone marketplace in the world, where you could buy a consumer grade drone. From a, from a sales standpoint, it began to crush it. Um, the first year it did a little over six million, the second year uh, it did uh, a little over 15 million and so forth. Um, it continues today 
and continues to outpace its competition. However, as I will explain below, its true success has come from the pivots it has presented. Um, by being in front of the fire hose of the online marketplace of drone technology and all these people buying, we have learned many different products and product sets that people are interested in. Um, and consequently have been able to produce the product or the service that they wanted. Um, does anyone in here play basketball? A, a lot of you play basketball. Will someone, uh, will someone just volunteer to tell me what a pivot is in basketball and why you do it? Anyone? Someone just want to stand up and, what's a pivot? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> right, and so why do you pivot? Why pivot? Exactly. Yes, to get an advantage over the defender. When you're, when you're playing basketball, the reason why you pivot is because there is not a clear path to the hoop. So instead, you, go, you pivot this way or you pivot that way. And so, so many times in business, you will start your business, you'll start your idea, your product, whatever, and you, there will be something in your way. It's just not quite clicking. And then you pivot. And, and maybe your path is blocked again, and then you pivot again, and then you pivot again. So you guys are here in this class for a reason. Hopefully it's because you have the idea that you want to start your own business. The sooner you take action on that idea, the sooner you're going to get your first pivot. When you start selling your idea or your product or your service, you will quickly learn that what you thought would work and was a clear shot to the golden streets of retirement is not. And you will most likely run into a, a defender. Um, the more times you pivot, the better chance you have of finding that open ground, that clear path. Um, in my late 20s, I started a business building luxury custom homes for high-end customers. Things were going well until 2006 happened, and then it morphed into a worse 2007, which morphed into a horrible 2008. All of a sudden, rates were going up, people were losing their jobs, and nobody was buying. I was sitting on development land and luxury homes, paying out an arm and a leg and holding costs. Things were not good. What was to be my early paved golden exit soon morphed into a ride in the dark on Space Mountain while vomiting on everyone around me. <laughs> and that is a true disgusting story. Um, has anyone ever done Space Mountain? It, it, you get sick and sometimes you throw up. And that was what 2008 was like. I spent the next year negotiating with banks who were taking also massive hits. Um, while doing this, I realized that what was costing me an arm and a leg thousands and thousands of dollars in holding costs was actually a potential gold mine. Um, at that point, I truly learned the art of the pivot. Um, I started reaching out to several travel agencies and corporate groups and realized that they were looking for what I was holding and I, that I couldn't sell. They were looking for a luxury home to hold their events in. So I soon started reaching out to those guys and saying, listen, I have this, I have this beautiful home. I built it just for this. I didn't, but... I'm selling it, and I would love to rent it to you. And soon enough, I started filling, um, I started filling the home, the, the homes with, uh, with with renters, with with corporate retreats. And all of a sudden, what was costing me an arm and a leg was actually making me more money than I, other than otherwise I would have had I just sold it. Um, so, so many times in life, when you think things are just going extremely crappy, and things are not going well, and you're and you're going to, down the path of your business. What you think is bad is actually really good. So uh, when I was uh, 26, I lived up in Park City with uh, five other friends. Uh, we had dated our way through Summit County. In fact, the reason we were there is because we had kind of been in Salt Lake and had been shunned and hadn't met anyone and got, been rejected a million times and just hadn't worked out, right? And so we thought, okay, let's all move to Park City. Let's rent a big house. Let's, let's stay in a big house together. Let's see how it goes. Um, we went to the singles ward, and as you guys know, sometimes singles wards peter out really quick, and you know maybe the girl you like doesn't like you, or, or the guy you like doesn't like you, or whatever. And so we kind of, we kind of uh, burned our way through that. So um, I thought, man, this, we need, something needs to change. A pivot needs to happen. So we, uh, we, we decided to throw a party. And we decided that um, we were going to invite as many people as possible. It was going to be the biggest singles party that Summit County had ever seen. Um, as we were going, we decided to pivot again. You see, we're getting more and more niche. 
we decided we were only going to invite girls. And the girls that we were inviting, if they brought any guys, they couldn't come. <laughs> and, the reason, and the reason why we, we told them that was because, if, um, because there was plenty of guys already going, you know, the six of us. And so, <laughs> and, and you guys know in, in, with your cell phones now, like you can, you can pretty much marshal like a thousand people with just big text groups of people. So we all got on our cell phones, and yeah, we had cell phones back then, and started texting everyone. Um, soon enough, we had um, a ton of you know, commitments, and we had a couple hundred girls come that night. And uh, we made, so we, you know, the preparation came into, into play. We made the house extremely dark, not so dark that it was like creepy, I'm gonna murder you dark, <laughs> but dark with lights and, and, and loud music so that people's senses were kind of dulled. So that when the, the, the girls would come, the groups of girls would come in, they wouldn't realize, they would just kind of see figures in the, in the dark. They wouldn't realize that, uh, that uh, there's only five or six guys there. Um, <laughs> soon enough, they would realize it, and then they would leave. So the moral of this story is, that's how I met my wife. <laughs> and, and that was my first successful exit of a business, and my first harvest, my first, um, it, was, it was amazing. Um, and so if I had not pivoted, not just once, but twice, the first pivot was um, throw a huge party and only and you know and make it the biggest singles word party ever. The second pivot, or not singles word, but singles party. The second pivot was make it super dark, and and the third pivot was only invite girls. And so it all just started to come together. I know it's silly. I know it's silly, but I tell that story because that is how your business, I promise you, will will start. I, I know you guys have everyone in here has ideas, right? That they want to start, that they want to do a service idea a product they want to sell, I promise, well, I don't, I'm not 100%, but I'm 95% certain that when you, start, when you start your business, it will end up being completely different than, than how you started. Um, if you don't look to pivot almost immediately, the chances of you failing are very high. Um, my second point, and I end at 345, right? Okay. My second point um, is the temple. And and I mean the LDS temple. I believe that most of you guys are of the LDS faith here, right? Maybe some of you aren't, but this message is for everyone. The temple will be your secret weapon. Um, God and his angels, our ancestors and allies on the other side, control what I like to think of as the celestial matrix. Everyone here has seen the matrix, right? There is an actual celestial matrix in my doctrinal opinion. Um, that they have their, their fingers in, their minds on. They have, the, they have their fingers on the pulse of this world. The point where our weak mortal existence meets the perfect immortal existence on the other side that has access to this matrix is in the temple. By going to the temple, the pivots of business in our life are made known to us much earlier than we otherwise would have known, much cleaner, much more clear, and at times, if we had not gone to the temple, in my own testimony, in my own experience, we would never have come across the pivot or the idea that brought us to the success we were looking for. Why? Here are some quotes. And I'm sorry I don't have this up here. I should have uh, uh, gotten a, uh, a, a presentation, but I'll just read some of these. John A. Widstos, Wid, Widstos has said, at the most unexpected moments in or out of the temple will come to us as a revelation, the solution of the problems that vex our lives. It is a place where revelations may be expected. He also pointed out that whosoever seeks to help those on the other side through temple work receives help in return in all the affairs of life. I, I, I laugh at the story of meeting my wife through that Park City party, but um, I truly believe that the reason why I truly did meet her, because I thought I was 26, I thought, oh man, it's over for me, I'm, it's over. I, I'm not going to meet anyone ever. I, I graduated from BYU. I don't, no. But um, I truly believe that the reason why I met and, and she met me was because we, I had just started just renewing my vigor of going to the temple. Um, I would started volunteering, and so had she, had I, I found out later. I truly believe that when that happened, it allowed those on the other side on whose behalf we were serving to put their finger into that matrix and help us. And so obviously we don't go to the temple to get rich. We don't go there thinking, oh man, 
I'm going to come out of here and just have a million billion dollar idea. Um, we go out of there to we go there to serve first, but also there is such a return of, on our investment of our time. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's true. Again, Elder Whitstow pointed out that whosoever seeks to help those on the other side receives help in return in all the affairs of life. I've never been to the temple and had and had like an angel or God tell me, do this or do that. Or if you do this, you'll, you'll succeed. Um, what has happened, however, is that after going to the temple, roadblocks in my business, in my life, that initially seemed insurmountable, immediately not only became surmountable, but were resolved much faster and easier than they would have had I not been to the temple. This has happened to me over and over again. I love real estate. In my opinion, there is no greater path to creating long-term, sustainable, residual income um, than real estate. When you purchase a building or build a building in the right place for the right cost, for the right purpose, you create residual income that will continue, that could continue your whole life into your children's life, into their children's lives, and so on. I have built my entire entrepreneurial career upon the rock of residual real estate income. The temple is the same way. Every time you go, you are basically building another spiritual property, let's call it, um, that will bless you forevermore. The more you go, the more spiritual properties you acquire. Um, it's, it's, it's a residual effect. Um, it is where we go to put our business ventures in harmony with God's will. In my own experience, there is no greater investment on your, of your time. Put it first, and its owner will put you first as well. Here's a certainty for you. If you are consistent in your path of entrepreneurship, it's not when you are involved. Oh, I thought I was going somewhere else with this. It's not when you are involved in a lawsuit. It's how often. Change the mood really quick. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I say that because as you succeed in your life and as you uh, build your business, you most likely will be sued, or you most likely will sue someone else. Um, recently, I was involved in a rather aggressive, ugly lawsuit, um, not of my own making. It was really eating, eating away at me, because I, I, I seriously, I hate all contention. I couldn't see a clear way past it and was feeling very discouraged. Um, after struggling with it for a couple of weeks, I realized I have not been to the temple for a long time. Um, I wanted to kick myself because I knew what my solution was. It was not to put all my energy on this lawsuit and figure out how to get past it. It was to go to the temple. Um, I had a normal experience. I, I prayed and, and asked for help. I served and, and nothing really happened. Nothing too special, but remember, the temple is a residual vehicle for success in your life. I started immediately to notice changes. Changes started to happen where the first week after going, hearts begin to be softened. The next week, the lawsuit, which had previously been impossible to get through and was gonna potentially cost me two or three years of my life, went away. Um, it would be easy to say, is, did, it, did the lawsuit go away because I went to the temple? It would be easy to say, I don't know, I, I think so. But I will say that it would not have gone away. I know that, it would not have gone away because I went to the temple and put my, my life into that matrix and, and, and served and, and it's like I immediately enlist, enlisted an army of heart softeners on the other side that started softening hearts and making these insurmountable obstacles go away. So, um, there's a, I, I'm not, this is the only scripture I'm going to share, but it is BYU, so I can share it. Mosiah 2, 22 to 24. This is King Benjamin speaking, and behold, all that he requires of you is to keep his commandments. And he has promised you that if you would keep his commandments, you should prosper in the land. And he never doth vary from that which he hath said. Therefore, if you do keep his commandments, he doth bless you and prosper you. And now in the first place, he hath created you and granted unto you your lives for which you are indebted unto him. And secondly, he doth require that you should do as he hath commanded you, for which if ye do, he doth immediately bless you. And therefore he hath paid you, and you are still indebted unto him. You guys are all familiar with those verses. The part that I love about that is that when you, when you do as he hath commanded, you aren't blessed in two weeks, in three weeks, in a year, in two years. 
you are blessed immediately. And I, I testify that when I went to the temple that day with this ugly lawsuit, I was blessed immediately. Um, obviously, immediately sometimes will mean a different things to different people in different situations. I've been in lawsuits where they didn't go in two weeks. They, they took six months. But um, it's not like I'm all, all, always in lawsuits. I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I don't think I've ever sued anyone. It's always people just, you know, doing what they do, right? Um, okay, this is my third point. You will succeed, and this is why. Well, I'll tell you why in a second. But you will also fail. And you might fail over and over and over and over again. This is where I get to the part, the, the, the part you were talking about. Um, before you finally succeed. In fact, I would argue that perhaps the greatest indicator of whether or not you will succeed personally as an entrepreneur is by how many times you have failed, gotten up, learned from their, your failure, and, and kept going. It sounds so easy to say, oh, you're going to fail, and you're going to learn and get back up. But when you're failing, you feel like the biggest loser. You feel like the world's collapsing around you. Um, things aren't, it's not fun, but if you can remember when you are failing that, gosh, I'm here to fail. Like, I'm supposed to fail. The more I fail, the better chance I have of succeeding. Um, I have failed so many times already. Um, I've only, I've only, I'm only 14 years removed, from, well, actually a little bit more from most of you, but 14 to 18 years removed from you guys. Um, here's some fun examples of failures that I've had. An arthritis cream treatment company. <laughs> um, uh, I, I won't even get into that one. <laughs> Luxury home development company. The recession blew that one sky high. Land speculation company. Again, the recession killed me. Vacation rental website. I could not keep up with the technology of my competitors. Lead acquisition company. It was too saturated in what I was doing. A custom backpack company. Too saturated. A hotel. I was so successful in driving massive traffic to this hotel and massive business that the, the local neighbors decided that they were sick of its location and its jurisdiction there. They were going to sue me. And so they brought so, much, so many lawsuits and hours of, of, of um, what's it called when you sit there and you're depo litigation de deposed? So much, what? Dep deposition. So many hours of deposition and just the load of crap that I finally just gave up and sold it. Um, SEO marketing company, too many chiefs and not enough Indians, it goes on and on and on. I've failed so many times. But one of the biggest reasons for these lectures is not to learn what to do, right, but to learn what not to do. Things like, and I just, here's, here's my five things of what not to do. Never, ever, ever personally sign on to debt to start or to grow your company. There is, in my opinion, a 50-50 chance that it will come back and it will eat you. Two, don't take on a partner. But if you do, and I almost always have, I know it's contradictory, but that's what an entrepreneur is, make sure it's someone that works just as hard as you, is willing to sacrifice just as much as you, and has strengths that counter your weaknesses. And I think that actually goes really well in who you end up marrying as well. Number three, don't bring on investors if you can help it shoestring everything possible, especially in the beginning. Who cares if it takes you three to six months longer to get to where you want to be? You will own 100% of your company still. Take on investors when they have to pay you a ton of money to be part of what you're doing. Um, four, don't wait until it's perfect. It does not have to be perfect. Just get it out there. Launch the sucker. Test your market. Tweak and pivot as you go on your way to perfection. And finally, five, don't put your eggs in one basket. You need a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. If this doesn't work out, then what? If that doesn't work out, then what? Things don't work out way more than they do work out. And it's usually plan B, C, or Z that is what you end up doing. So failure is good. People say it's better to learn from others' failures, and that's kind of a big reason why you guys are here. And that's why I loved sitting where you guys are sitting. I took this class like three times because I just I loved hearing what everyone had to say. Um, but when you fail yourself, I think it's better because you actually feel the pain. Like the next time you have the temptation to put your hand on that iron hot stove, you're gonna immediately your brain your brain is gonna flash pain to your hand or to your mind. And 
it's, it's going to, uh, you're, you're going to not do that same mistake again. Um, you gain wisdom from that pain and failure. From my own experience, I can say that if you never give up when starting to fail, and, not, and when things aren't going the way you want, and if you constantly pivot, and if you make the temple like the keystone of your entrepreneurship journey, you may, you may be some, like some um, lecturers here who succeeded wildly on their first business, but there's a 90 plus percent chance that you won't succeed on your first business, or at least on the first idea that you have. It will come later after failing and pivoting and failing and pivoting. Um, all it takes is consistency, thick skin, and unwavering belief that if you are doing something that benefits you, your family, and those around you, and that is not contrary to God's will, that you will succeed. Um, I said in the beginning that, um, actually, I don't know if I said this, but when I first started as an entrepreneur, or it, when I first was getting all excited about being an entrepreneur, one of my biggest like excitements was, oh man, I'm gonna make so much money. I'm gonna make like a billion dollars or a hundred billion dollars or be the richest person ever because I wanna have like a boat and a houseboat and like a home in every state and like just tons of really cool stuff. Lots of stuff, so much stuff. Um, let me tell you a lesson I've learned since those, those desires. Um, and you know, I still like, I like stuff. We all like stuff. But something that I've learned, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, so don't take it personally if I'm just saying what you already know. We don't possess possessions, they possess us. Is that, is, is that not true? They possess us. The less you own, I have found, the simpler your life is. The simpler your life is, the, happy, the happier you are, period. It's, it's, it's an irrefutable lesson that it may take some people their whole life to learn it, but if you can just learn it now, it, it, it makes things so much easier. Some of my happiest years were sitting right where you guys are now with pretty low overhead. Um, I had a side job surrounded by like-minded people, constantly learning from the spirit, constantly being fed knowledge. Don't get me wrong, it's nice to pay off debt. It's nice to have security for your family. It's nice to uh, get away and travel and experience life and maybe drive like a, a car that doesn't break down every two seconds. And you, and you do need money for that. Um, but there is a line, and as you guys already know, the spirit tells you when you have crossed that line. Um, mm -hmm. One of my material goals, um, when I when I made it was I was gonna I was gonna buy uh, front row jazz tickets and I was gonna go be at every jazz game. I was so excited. I bought them and I quickly realized that the time it took to drive down there, eat dinner, sit for the game, and drive home for over 40 games a year was basically a sinful waste of my time. I was spending more time scheduling and going to games than I was spending with my own kids. Um, it was a colossal waste of time and so I ditched my tickets. Learn my lesson once again. Um, succeed to get your temporal needs taken care of. But once that's done, I challenge you to spend every penny after that. Once you've found a, a comfortable, as President Hinckley always said, a comfortable, modest home. Pay off a comfortable, modest home. He didn't say pay off a 10,000 square foot comfortable and modest home. Um, he didn't say that. But once you've done that and secured yourself and succeeded, I don't care how much money you have after that, I just challenge you to put every penny of that back to serving God. Um, can you imagine how your, your future children and maybe your present children, your spouse, how impacted their lives will be if you guys are around a ton and, and, are, and are spending a ton of time with them and not always gone? That is the power of being an entrepreneur. That is what, that is what should motivate you to be successful. Um, be that person, finally, that nobody knows or suspects that is secretly funding righteous wars on several fronts. And when I say that, I mean secret righteous wars on hunger, on poverty, on addiction, on abuse, on depression, on sadness. Do it in secret so nobody knows. Constantly be doing that. We probably all recall what God says, what happens when we do things like that in secret. Um, the best course I took at BYU was called the Entrepreneurial Perspective, um, taught by Keith Hunt and Larry Miller. Do they still have that course? Oh, man. 
we should we should like co-teach that or something. Anyway, um, on the last day of the course, everyone knows who Larry H. Miller is, right? Suppose some of you don't, maybe. Anyway, he owns the Jazz. He owns all the car dealerships. On the last, he's he he he's a billion. He was a billionaire. Um, on the last day of the course, he uh, he he brought his wife Gail, and um, and and basically. With his trademark, the guy was a crybaby. With his trademark tears, he told us that he had done it all wrong. He said, I did it all wrong. And this is a, this is a billionaire standing there, right? Who bought the jazz and the fan stores and the, the movie theaters and all the, the car dealerships and a million other businesses and had everything. He had everything. This is a guy saying he did it all wrong. Um, he said, I, wouldn't, I would not work 90 hours per week. I would work 50. I wouldn't be gone every weekend working. I'd be home with my kids. Um, his wife was there, and after he ended, ended talking, she said the same thing. She said, I was like a single mom. We almost got divorced several times. By the grace of God, we did not get divorced. I was a single mom raising my kids by myself. Larry, who was fanatical about numbers, had thought about this for years, and by his calculations, he would have achieved the same amount of success that he had achieved, um, but about three to five years later had he worked those 50 hours instead of those 90 hours. Because he said he had not achieved balance, his kids and marriage had suffered. He did rein it in, rein it in later and did countless good. The softball stadium here, or the baseball stadium here is named after him. He's done countless things, but he said, I, would, I, I did it all wrong. Um, you could tell this was probably the most important lesson that he had to, to, to share with us. Um, that this was an experience that we should not learn on our, on our own, that we should learn from him. And I have never forgotten that, how important it is to, um, how important it is to, to not get lost in your own success. And you may not be successful yet, but you will be. And when that happens, um, you have to remember what he said. You have to remember not, there, there's two types of entrepreneurs. There's one that's just gone, right? And that's just working nonstop because it never ends. They just want more, 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 more. And there's another type that I call a lifestyle entrepreneur, where you get, you get to a point where you have enough money that your needs are taken care of and you're secure and safe. And then you spend, dang it, a ton of time with your family. You, you build those relationships. You, you, raise your, you help raise your kids. You're around. And so... I, th I feel like that's the goal, not to, uh, to make, like I wanted to in the very beginning, a trillion dollars, but to make enough so that your needs are met and so that you can be a powerful weapon in God's hands. Um, so I, I wanted to, to, I have, let's see, five minutes. I wanted to talk about what to do now. Um, there is no greater time than today. Right now, the internet has made it possible. Um, if you, if you started tomorrow morning, you could have a business running with traffic flowing to, and this is, I'm talking about e-commerce, but this basically applies to everything. But almost everything's e-commerce now, right? Like, it's getting to the point where more than 50% of retail is online. And of that retail online, I think 30% of that is on Amazon. And, but, and that's just starting to spread all over the place. So when people start a business, it's almost always that they go online first, and then they go, uh, um, then they go brick and mortar. But anyway, you could have a business tomorrow. If you have an idea in your head, a product in your head, a service in your head, um, and, I, and I speak from experience, by the way, you could have a business, you could start tomorrow morning. Um, the first thing you would do, and by the end of the day, sorry, and by the end of the day, you would have a business that had traffic, that was running, that was getting sales, and you would just start growing every day from then on out. There's no reason why you guys can't graduate from BYU already having one or two or three very successful e-commerce sites. And that is because almost everyone buys services, products, ideas online now. There's no reason why if you have the true dedication and, the, and you say, I'm, I'm gonna do this, why you could not do that. And this is how, and these are just uh, my, my 10 simple steps. This is how you could do it and have that, that business making money. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have this on the, uh, thing, but we can share that later, right? Um, this is how you can have it making money by tomorrow. Um, one, 
identify the product, idea, or service you want to sell. Two, pay someone on Fiverr, and I, th this isn't a perfect roadmap, but this is basically what I have done several times. Two, pay someone on Fiverr.com five bucks to design your not perfect logo and design and labeling. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be something. It's not gonna stop people from buying if, if you have what they want. Yeah. Oh, Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. It's kind of like the poor man's way to market, and they actually have a ton of um, freelancers on there that will do basically anything for you online. Um, and it costs mostly f five bucks. Um, number three, start a free website on Shopify.com. That's what I prefer. They have a 45-day um, free trial. You just have to search around for it. Usually it's 15 days. You search around, there is a 45-day link a free trial, and then after that, it's like $40 a month. Um, um, number four, list your product, idea, or service, and write five or six paragraphs around it, and you can get a template on Shopify. They have like 30 free templates, and they all look great, and they all work. You can, then you list your product, your, or your idea, or your service, and you write content around it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just fill in the boxes that it gives you, and you, you buy some images online or you put your own images up. Lifestyle images, like if you're selling like a speaker, someone holding the speaker, someone laughing with it or dancing to it, whatever. It's, it's you know, you, you guys get my drift. Number five, start an Instagram account, Facebook account, Twitter account, Pinterest, and YouTube account. Um, number six is attach the Instagram account, Facebook and Twitter account so that when you post on one, it posts on all three, right? And, and, uh, and then start uploading maybe 30 days worth of posts. So they'll just automatically do it for you. Uh, um, you can either do that through Facebook or there's a, there's a, there's a, a service called hootsuite.com. Hootsuite, is kind of a dumb name, but there's several other services out there um, that are free where you can upload things that you want to be posted and it will post it over a 30 day period. You've done that. Number seven, start daily posting on all five mediums. I already kind of said this, but using hashtags pertaining to your industry. Social media, as you guys know, is everything as far as easy, free, targeted traffic. If you are posting um, one, two, three, or four, I mean, post as much as you want. Be as, as annoying as you want. Um, I found that you end up getting more traffic and more customers than you actually end up annoying um, by being annoying on social media. Sorry for people that are annoyed on social media, but it does work. Um, start hashtagging like crazy on things that pertain to your industry that you're uh, starting. Number eight, start your first daily blog on your idea, product, or service on your site using long tail keywords that pertain to popular searches on Google. And what I mean by that is when you, when you get on Google, and let's say you're starting a, uh, again, a Bluetooth speaker company, and you, and you start typing in Bluetooth speaker and you know how it automatically populates like eight different or 10 different uh, popular qu queries for that, for that search term. Well, those are the things that are being searched the most. So you start writing blogs using a ton of, the, ton of keywords that apply to those, those popular searches. So um, number eight is you start your first daily blog. You write a 500 page blog article and using those words that are, are heavily searched. Um, on this same e-commerce business, drones, et cetera, I got one minute left. Um, on this same e-commerce business, drones, et cetera, almost half of my traffic and sales come from one single article that I wrote um, that has gotten us to the top one or two or three um, search results when you search drone store online. The power of a blog post using keywords that are searched often is massive. It will drive a ton of traffic to your site. Um, nine, once you start getting the sales, figure out how you're gonna fulfill. I know that's, that should be at the first, but I like it at the end because then you do everything else. You start getting sales and you're like, oh crap, how do I fulfill this? You know, and there's so many ways. You can use Ali, um, Ali, Alibaba or AliExpress.com, Wish.com, or a ton of other wholesale service sites out there that you can just Google into. And number 10, scale it. And then, Harvest it, grow, or grow it, harvest it, take the money, go buy yourself something nice and do it all over again. Um, anyway, if you do that every single day, you will succeed and you will build yourself a multi-million dollar business. 
while you're failing and pivoting along the way. And uh, do we say in the name of Jesus Christ around here? In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thanks for coming, guys.